Director of Strategic Partnerships at STEM Connector. Uh, we're coming today from our offices in Washington, D.C. Uh, on a sunny but chilly uh, November afternoon uh, to discuss a topic that has generated a great deal of attention in the last couple of years uh, in our world of STEM education, and that is making. We have an outstanding group of speakers today uh, from every aspect of, uh, of, of this issue, uh, from the highest, I think you can't get any higher, um, echelon of decision making, the White House, um, to folks that are on the ground actually doing the, the important work of uh, working with students to uh, change the way that people are, are learning. Uh, the maker movement to me and to us at STEM Connector is not a top-down movement. Uh, it is inspired by an innate desire to create, uh, leveraging the do-it-yourself initiative that is uh, part of our uh, American uh, thread of being. Uh, we've seen a lot of devices that have emerged that have made uh, making a lot easier, uh, 3D printing, uh, laser cutters, robotics, um, and it just seems like uh, making is about as American as apple pie. Uh, we are... Um, a culture that is driven by entrepreneurship. Our innovation depends on our entrepreneurship. You don't have to look no further than the computer that you're on, uh, the chips that run it, to the, the phones that you have, um, to know that, that entrepreneurship and innovation are, are critical. Uh, at STEM Connector, we are dedicated to identifying, informing, and connecting diverse stakeholders in STEM education. Started in 2011 as a vision, we have grown into a network of over uh, 20, uh, of over 80 member organizations. Some of you might know us from the STEM Daily or EdTech Weekly or even our social media presence. Others might remember us through our 100 Women Leaders in STEM and our most recent 100 uh, CEO Leaders in STEM. We have a website, stemconnector.org, that has over 6,000 entities profiled, and we are constantly looking for ways to keep this ecosystem primed with timely information and opportunities for connection and collaboration. This summer, we connected with our friends at the Maker Ed Initiative one of the few national organizations that is actually newer than STEM Connector. We immediately realized there were so many connections to be made between our organizations and that making is a critical piece in this emerging world of STEM education. We believe that making is a disruptive force and has the ability to literally change the game. Today we have assembled a group of speakers who each bring a unique perspective to this conversation. From the White House to every State House, there has been a call for a new vision for how students learn about STEM. From the policymaking community, we brought you two speakers, Tom Khalil from the White House and Chris Rowe from the California STEM Learning Network. Leading the call for better outcomes in STEM uh, has been our, have been our nation's employers. Today, we will hear from two highly innovative companies, Intel and Cognizant, who are investing in maker programs. You will hear from two visionary corporate investors in education, Mark Greenlaw and Carlos Contreras. The connection between employers and the K-12 education system, our universities, community colleges, um, is critical for the next generation workforce. <coughs> Today we will also hear from the Dean of Arizona State University, its College of Technology and Innovation, Dr. Mitzi Montoya, about the outreach that they are, suppo they are supporting for maker programming in the Phoenix area. You do not have to look hard in communities to hear about maker-type programs springing up. This past weekend, I was at an art studio here in Washington, D.C., where I learned of a small movement emerging in this fair city. A little over a year ago, I was wandering through the Lakeview neighborhood in Chicago when I was pulled into the amazing Nettlehurst Elementary School. We will hear from Ted Ganchiff, who has led the charge to integrate an amazing program in his school, uh, his son's school. And we will also hear from a social entrepreneur just north of us in Charm City, uh, and a.k.a. Baltimore. <laughs> you will hear from Andrew Coy, Executive Director of the Digital Harbor Foundation, a relatively new but mighty force in Baltimore's Inner Harbor neighborhood. First, however, I'd like to introduce my colleague Paloma Garcia Lopez from the Maker Ed Initiative. She is joined by big deal maker Kip Bradford in their Oakland offices. Uh, Kip is up from the great state of Rhode Island, my home state and uh, has been leading Maker Initiatives there and is also a board member of Maker N. I'd also like to thank uh, our underwriter for this uh, work, uh, the Cisco Foundation, and our good friend Alex Bellos, whose vision has made STEM Connector a reality. So I am going to switch it over to you, Paloma, and let you take it.
And hang on, let me not do that. But let me. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, and you are ready to go. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Paloma Garcia Lopez, and I am the executive director of Maker Education Initiative. We are pleased to have everybody here today. Um, I'm lucky to count three of the speakers today as board members of Maker Education Initiative. We launched in 2012 with the support of Maker Media, Intel, Cognizant, and Pixar Animation Studios. And we've done a great deal of work over the last uh, year and a half, and we're really excited about the year ahead of us. I'm going to show you a few slides just to give you a context for the work that we're doing, because there's about four or five exciting projects we're working on right now. I think I need to screen share now. Uh, yeah. Uh, there we go. Can you all see that maker education initiative? So as you know, um, we are a nonprofit educational organization, and our founders are those in the maker movement. Uh, Dale Doherty is our chair and founder. And um, if you haven't read Make Magazine, pick it up. Um, technologists really love to read this, and um, many describe it as the central organ of the maker movement. Uh, you may have gone to a fair in your city or your part of the world. There's over a hundred mini maker fairs and two large uh, signature maker fairs in New York and in the Bay Area where over hundreds of thousands of people attend every year and have become really excited about this movement. Uh, more and more over the years kids are getting involved in making and people are saying that making can be a great solution in the STEM education area, especially to fill all those great jobs that we would love to fill with young Americans who are prepared for those jobs, and we agree with that. Our founder and our board members speak all over the country, and the message is very unifying. It's that we are all makers, that uh, making is a return to the hand. It's, it's not something new. It's something that many, many of us have been doing, especially in the do-it-yourself movement. Uh, making connects things that you create in the physical world to the digital world. And with the democratization of technology, we have a variety of tools available to us at a very low cost that were not available 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, you can have a 3D printer in your house these days. Um, making um, is very interdisciplinary, and that's where we think invention happens. Um, it's exper experiential, it's collaborative, it's playful. It's really fun. That's what you see when you go to these fairs. You see adults having fun, and kids really like that, too. Um, and inquiry and design is really driven by student interest. So it's not, here's a kit with a finite solution. It's, here's a bunch of materials with infinite possibilities, and you can create whatever you want. And oftentimes, the creation is relevant to the students' lives. It's relevant to a problem they see in the community. And that's the kind of thinking that we need to drive the next generation of STEM professionals. Makers are also part of a distributive net, distributed network, so there's not one place or one entity or one person that is the expert on making. It's available all over the country in any size and shape of organization, and we've been able to hone in on that at, at Maker Education Initiative by creating a community of practice of all of these experts, whether they be in museums, libraries, universities, or in corporations, or in the community and youth serving groups who have relationships with parents and with kids already and just want to embed making in what they're doing. Making um, allows us to um, put this in front of kids in all communities. In our organization, that is our charge, is to spread making into new communities, um, make sure that people have access to this new and exciting way to engage in STEM education. Our mission is to create more opportunities for young people to develop confidence, creativity, and an interest in STEM, the arts, and learning as a whole through making. The arts and um, working on things that address the, the whole learning, the whole child, is very important to us. And we do it in three areas. Um, to achieve that mission, we work with educators and facilita facilitators so they feel comfortable making. Um, we work with organizations to help them build capacity to introduce making in their existing programs and services. And we work with communities because, after all, communities need tools and resources so they can lead the charge, so they can advocate for making, and they can get more and more people engaged in it. Our programs <coughs> include 
<clears throat> excuse me, Maker Corps, Young Makers, Maker Vista, and what we call Every Child a Maker. <clears throat> we were fortunate enough to launch in 2012 at the Clinton Global Initiative, and you'll see uh, there on stage uh, in 2012 our founding director, Anne Marie Thomas, who's the creator of Squishy Circuits, along with Mark Greenlaw of Cognizant and Carlos Contreras of Intel, who backed us to launch this program to bring human capacity to organizations. The interest was definitely there, but how to do it and who could do it was not. And through Maker Corps, we trained 108 core members, and over 90,000 kids and families were engaged in making experiences across 19 states. By 2015, we hope to train 1,000 core members, and you know our goal was to reach 50,000 kids by 2015, but we've already done that in our first year. So sky's the limit for what we'll do in 2015. And through generous support from Google for Entrepreneurs and Cognizant as platinum sponsors of Maker Core, we were, we were really able to surpass our initial goals. We also adopted the Young Makers program, which was largely volunteer run. Uh, Dale Doherty of Maker Media and Tony DeRose of Pixar Animation Studios had done this as a labor of love in the community in the Bay Area. We're now taking this to scale across the country and helping communities start clubs, helping these clubs connect with science-rich institutions in their area. For example, here we have the Lawrence Hall of Science as well as the Exploratorium and the Tech Museum of Innovation engaged in the project. We're going to do that again in other parts of the country. Uh, examples of fabulous young makers include this young lady who built a house that hangs on the wall and has uh, circuits and LED lights throughout it. We have these young women who created a mermaid fishtail and learned how to use a laser cutter and used a lot of CAD tools online to 3D print some of the pieces and they say it's sturdier than what their grandfather bought them uh, for Christmas. We've got these young men at Lighthouse Charter School in Oakland who turned this truck, uh, a gas run engine truck, into an electric vehicle. And we've got these young men from Marin County who created a Battlestar Galactica simulator and this uh, plane turns in 360 degrees on two axles. Very exciting work. We've got teachers in Annalee High School in Sebastopol and Pittsburgh High School in Pittsburgh, California, building maker spaces in their classrooms. We're starting to see this all over the country. And this year, we were able to develop a partnership with AmeriCorps Vista, and we will uh, be hiring 22 full-time capacity building VISTAs to increase opportunities for high poverty youth to engage in making. And this ultimately will impact their academic engagement in these low-income communities. We will have 10 VISTAs in California and 10 VISTAs in other parts of the country. Here are some examples of these outstanding young people who are giving a year of service to their country to spread making into high poverty communities. Some of our partners, which I'm just flipping through the slides now, include SAM Academy, Lighthouse Charter, and Da Vinci Center. These are community organizations already engaging and making, and with the help of these wonderful VISTAs, they are going to reach thousands of more young people. Other resources that we're providing are open portfolios. We're making a national recommendation in conjunction with Indiana University to assist uh, young people and people who serve um, young people with an e-portfolio system that is open-ended, that is owned by the student, that will help them get into better colleges and better jobs. And so we're consulting also with industry and education experts to develop those best tools and recommendations. And we're ongoing, we provide training and support to organizations. And this is an example of some work we did at Adventure Museum, um, where we train the entire staff on how to develop a space and how to work with young people in their space. We believe making intersects uh, right there where the star is. Uh, math and science is integral to kids creating projects that are connected to their interests. Without knowing it, they're using math and science conce concepts, they're using creative problem solving, and they're making things and they're breaking things. And the fact that they're breaking them and starting over or fixing their designs, that's exactly the kind of thing we want to see in the next generation workforce that includes wonderful innovators and entrepreneurs from all communities all over the country. 
So we want to thank again Cognizant Maker Media, Intel, and Pixar Animation Studios for making our work possible. And we're so proud of what we've done in the past year, and we can't wait to keep going in the next year with fabulous partners like those you have on line today um, from Arizona State University and Digital Harbor Foundation who went along with us on the ride in this past year. Thank you, Paloma. I think I'm back. Uh, that was terrific. Um, now I'm going to hide you guys uh, and uh, reveal our, our, our next guest as I, as I introduce him. Uh, it's clear uh, that Paloma and her team are incredibly dedicated. They have an incredibly enthusiastic board. Uh, we deal with uh, nonprofits in uh, all over the uh, United States and, and the world, and, and I have not found uh, folks as uh, many folks as, as enthusiastic as uh, Paloma and her staff. Uh, our next uh, speaker, our first guest speaker today, is is, uh, is being brought to you by um, sponsored by Cisco and uh, uh, brought to you by uh, MakerEd and STEM Connector. Is Tom Khalil, and Tom is uh, deputy director for technology and innovation for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and Senior Advisor for Science, Technology, and Innovation for the National Economic Council. In this role, Tom serves as Senior White House Staffer charged with coordinating the government's technology and innovation agenda. Prior to serving in the Obama administration, Tom was Special Assistant to the Chancellor for Science and Technology at UC Berkeley. Tom served eight years in the Clinton White House, ultimately as Deputy Assistant to the President for Technology and Economic Policy and Deputy Director of the National Economic Council. And Tom, I'd like to thank you uh, for bringing us all together today. Uh, you guys certainly inspired us, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Ted, for helping to pull this together. Um, so I, I wanted to just uh, start off by uh, noting that uh, President Obama uh, has just made an announcement of $100 million in new grants that will be available for a program that is really directly related to the topic that we're talking about called Youth uh, Career Connect, which is encouraging uh, collaborations between uh, high schools and employers and institutions of higher education uh, to uh, prepare students for uh, the world of work. So I encourage all of you to, to, to check that out because I definitely think that uh, making could play uh, an important role in, in successful proposals in this area. Um, but I also wanted to start off by talking a little bit about why uh, the maker movement has really caught the attention uh, president in the White House. We think it's important for at least four reasons. One is that, as Paloma said, it advances values that are Im important as ends in themselves. So things like creativity and problem solving and uh, uh, self-expression um, uh, are, are just worthwhile goals that we should be pursuing in their own right. Second, we really do believe that the maker movement does have the potential to get more young boys and girls excited about the uh, STEM subjects, science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. Third, there are a lot of jobs, uh, particularly in areas like advanced manufacturing, where employers are having that uh, students getting hands-on experience with, uh, a, you know, computer numerically controlled machine tool or CADs for jobs. We think that the maker movement really does have the potential to encourage and stimulate innovation in hardware and uh, and in manufacturing. If you think about where the PC revolution came from. Uh, it really grew out of things like the Homebrew Computer Club uh, in uh, the 70s, and, and that's where uh, Steve Jobs and, and Steve Wozniak started working on, on what became the, the Apple computer, uh, in the same way that we're, we're beginning to see all sorts of startups emerge uh, out of the maker community. Uh, and in the same way that open source software and cloud computing has lowered the costs associated with uh, 
developing uh, startups in information technology and software. Uh, if entrepreneurs don't have to uh, own the means of production, they can just rent them. Uh, that will lower the barriers to innovation and entrepreneurship in, in the manufacturing sector. So th those are some of the reasons why the administration is really excited about uh, the maker movement. So I think if you uh, think about what goals sh we should have uh, as a country, one is to uh, really dramatically expand uh, the number of kids who have access to these types of opportunities. Uh, and as Paloma said, that requires a space, um, some place in their community where they can go, wh whether that's in a school or uh, in an after-school setting. Uh, they obviously need some core set of uh, tools and materials. Uh, and one of the exciting things that we're seeing is uh, inventors coming up with new tools. Uh, so uh, Saul Griffith, uh, who is an inventor with other labs, has been developing a really low-cost a uh, CNC machine tool for a couple hundred dollars that uh, is allowing uh, students uh, to have access uh, to these uh, advanced uh, advanced manufacturing tools. Uh, so they need a space, they need tools and supplies, and importantly, they need a mentor. Uh, so th those, I think, are the elements that need to come together. Uh, so that's the first goal that I think we should have as a, as a nation is like, how do we give more kids access to these opportunities? The second is, how do we have more uh, cities and towns and regions with a really uh, robust uh, and active maker community? Um, and uh, Ted, is, as you noted, that this is really a grassroots phenomena, and we're seeing uh, people uh, uh, and communities all over the country get organized uh, to do some amazing things. So w one example I would point to is some fantastic stuff happening in Pittsburgh where uh, the maker community and tech shop uh, and uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, and DARPA and the Veterans Administration uh, and the uh, Pennsylvania State AFL-CIO have all come together uh, to uh, train more workers uh, to, to be able to use these uh, new technologies so that uh, as CMU is producing all these startups, they have access to a trained workforce. Um, so uh, th those, I think, are some of the goals that we should have as, as a country. And the good news is that we now see a lot of great models um, that other individuals and organizations uh, can follow. So, you know, Paloma talked about how the AmeriCorps Vista program and a number of leading companies like Cognizant and Intel and Google uh, and Pixar are all working together with the Make Your Education Initiative to increase the number of youth-serving organizations all over the country uh, that are embedding making into their program. That's certainly something that can be scaled. We have great examples of organizations that have been willing to serve as an anchor tenant for a tech shop or a maker space or a fab lab. So uh, Ford did that in Dearborn. You're going to hear from Mitzi on, on what ASU has been doing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, DARPA and the VA have done that in Pittsburgh. Uh, Lowe's has been doing that in, in Austin, Texas. Uh, libraries and museums are getting involved. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the New York Hall of Science has really been a hub for making uh, in, the, in New York City. Uh, Exploratorium and, and Lawrence Hall of Science, Pittsburgh Children's Museum, uh, and libraries all over the country. Um, universities like uh, Arizona State and Georgia Tech uh, and UC Berkeley have been making investments uh, in, in maker spaces so that their undergrad students have access to this. Um, MIT has said that they're now actually going to uh, start uh, allowing students who are applying to MIT uh, to uh, have their maker portfolio uh, Paloma talked about, you know, the importance of having these uh, electronic portfolios so that students can show their work. Uh, MIT has said this is important enough so that it, this ought to be considered as part of the application process. Um, so those are just a couple of things uh, that are going on. 
We've tried to highlight this uh, through activities like the White, uh, the White House Science Fair. The president has said, you know, if you win uh, the Super Bowl or the NCAA, you get to the, come to the White House. The same thing should be true uh, if you win the first robotics competition or the Intel Science and Engineering Fair. Uh, and uh, uh, we've been proud to uh, feature uh, young makers uh, like J Joey, who, much to the delight of the Secret Service, uh, uh, brought in a extreme marshmallow cannon that uh, projected a marshmallow 180 feet across the East Room of the White House. So the bottom line is this is fun. Uh, this directly uh, uh, relates to things like STEM and advanced manufacturing. Uh, it can, I think, promote innovation and entrepreneurship and advanced manufacturing. Um, and I think that if we build this uh, coalition of individuals and organizations across the country, uh, we can create a grassroots infrastructure uh, for, for innovation and for uh, encouraging more people to get involved in, in STEM. So I would uh, encourage uh, more individuals and organizations to, to get involved and figure out how they can help. Tom, uh, thank you so much for your time. I know you are a busy guy, uh, and uh, thank you to uh, to Kumar, who um, who's uh, who's your sidekick, who's uh, who helped bring us uh, together this summer. Um, it sounds like you. Uh, this is pretty passionate for you uh, as a topic. Uh, Tom has 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 to leave us, uh, but if you would like to, uh, we can pass along questions. If you want to tweet to us. Um, the hashtag, I apologize for not mentioning it, on, on across social media platforms, uh, generally Google+, Plus, which is where we're broadcasting from, is Maker STEM, uh, and also on Twitter. Uh, we'll be following those. So, Tom, thank you so much, and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Okay, bye now. Okay, uh, we're going to now move um, to, a, uh, to the state level, uh, and uh, we are going to be joined by... Uh, Chris Rowe, who is the uh, CEO of the California STEM Learning Network. Uh, Chris Rowe is uh, in charge of, Chris is over, in, in that job, Chris is in charge of overseeing the creation of strategic relationships and collaborating with regional, state, and national partners to establish a network that will rapidly scale innovative STEM teaching and learning across K through 14 education. Prior to joining CSLN Net, Rowe served as Deputy Director for the Business Higher Education Forum a membership organization comprised of senior executives, CEOs, and college and university presidents, as well as foundation leaders working together to advance innovative solutions to the nation's most significant education challenges. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining us today. Or is your audio on? I think so. Can you hear me? You sounds good. Great. Well, thanks, Ted, and thanks to STEM Connector for organizing uh, today's uh, Town Hall. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking about the California perspective. Uh, there's a ton of really exciting things happening here in California around STEM education. Uh, Paloma and I are just fresh off uh, a two-day meeting, uh, a STEM, the first STEM symposium hosted by our state superintendent of public instruction, Tom Torlickson, which had uh, more than 2,000 educators from around the state uh, talking about STEM education and uh, that make, uh, make was a big part of those conversations as well. So uh, a little bit about California just uh, in terms of its history with the MAKE movement. I think we're really proud that California has been uh, really a robust part of the history of the MAKE movement. Obviously uh, with Dale Doherty and, and MAKE magazine uh, being founded here, the first Maker Fair uh, launching uh, in San Mateo, which I've had an opportunity to attend, which is just an amazing experience. So we're really excited to see that the MAKE movement has grown uh, tremendously across the entire nation. Um, just a little bit about uh, the California STEM Learning Network, or CSLNet, as we're known. We were founded in 2010. We're a nonprofit and really serving as a statewide uh, umbrella organization to really help uh, advance the STEM agenda across the entire state. We have three uh, key focus areas that we focus on. Uh, one is really supporting and growing innovative STEM networks across the entire state of California. We have uh, nine regional networks right now and, and growing uh, every day, adding more regional networks to that group. We also really care about ensuring that we've got a great STEM educator workforce in our state, both in the formal and informal spaces. 
And then finally, the third focus area is around uh, quality STEM learning experiences, ensuring that our students have access to quality STEM learning experiences both in the formal school day and informal school settings, which is obviously a great connecting point with the maker movement. Uh, our vision is that all students in our entire state uh, will have the necessary skills, especially in the STEM areas, to be successful, uh, not only in further schooling and careers, but in their daily lives. And again, I think this is, for us, how the MAKE movement really connects very closely to the work that we're doing. So just, uh, Paloma talked about a number of the things that are happening. Uh, a lot of those are happening here in California, but just to kind of reiterate, uh, we've been working very closely with the California uh, After School Division uh, and the California After School Network to launch an initiative called the Power of Discovery STEM Squared, which really leverages the robust after school infrastructure that we have here in the state of California uh, as an opportunity to really introduce high quality STEM learning activities. Uh, right now we're at more than 600 sites across the state and we've been talking a lot with Paloma about how we can really use that very robust infrastructure to bring make Maker to a much broader uh, number of students across the entire state as well. But here in California we also have the, the Tinkering Network, we have science workshops, so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of grassroots activities uh, that are underway. What we're trying to do as a statewide organization is to work with our regional partners to tap into this infrastructure and really help promote and grow uh, these kinds of activities across each region in the state. I know a lot of our regional networks have begun doing uh, many maker fairs, uh, which has been really exciting, uh, and tapping into, again, uh, the power of discovery and these other uh, activities that are underway. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk briefly about just the context of California and what I see as a terrific opportunity to connect more broadly with the maker movement. Here in California, uh, we've, uh, we are a Common Core state. Uh, we are rapidly rolling out Common Core with the allocation this year of uh, $1.25 billion, that's billion with a B, to help uh, promote the implementation of Common Core. Uh, we have also uh, adopted next generation science standards. We're the sixth state to adopt NGSS. Um, and I, I think the two of these together, <clears throat> and Paloma and, and Tom both kind of briefly touched on it, you know, we think that given the focus on the skills, uh, for example, next generation science standards, the science and engineering practices, the engineering design piece of that, that there are some really, really terrific opportunities to leverage as we roll out uh, both Common Core and Next Generation Science Standards, uh, the maker movement. One of the things that we've really tried to emphasize uh, in our initiatives is really bridging the formal and informal uh, spaces where we have real opportunities to leverage the kinds of exciting uh, activities that engage students uh, like, like the maker movement does. So um, we have some terrific opportunities in front of us here in California. Uh, that we're going to be focusing on over the next year plus and looking forward to working with Paloma and other organizations to really grow uh, the maker movement across the entire state. So thank you, uh, Ted, again, and uh, um, I'll be joining uh, for questions if there are any later on. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Chris used to work like right across the street from us and now he's across the country. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, you joining us for questions at the end. Um, I will hide you now and uh, get ready for our next speaker, who's actually sitting right next to me uh, on, a, on a trip to D.C., um, and is also uh, somebody that we've worked with for a while here at STEM Connector, um, better part of, of a year, uh, is uh, Dr. Mitzi Montoya, um, from, uh, who is Vice Provost and Dean of the College of In uh, Technology and Innovation at Arizona State University. Uh, she is responsible for advancing our college's mission uh, and providing leadership at the ASU Polytechnic campus. The mission of the College of Technology and Innovation is to develop innovative learning models and interdisciplinary educational programs in engineering, applied sciences, management, and entrepreneurship. The college par par partners with industry through capstone projects and faculty are deeply engaged in, in integrative and applied scholarship. So Mitzi, Mitzi, who is also a member of our Innovation Task Force, um, I will turn it over to you and uh, look forward to your presentation. 
Yes, I will, but you need to unmute yourself first. Uh, try, try now. Still muted. Let's see. Let's try again. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, I think I'm on. Thank you, Ted, and thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm sitting right next to Ted, so this is a great long-distance uh, presentation here. Um, I, I wanted to d just run through quickly a, a little bit about what we're doing and what I hope becomes an opportunity for other universities to follow suit. So Ted is going to run a few slides if he's able to share his desktop. And while he's doing that, I will tell you that we are the, I'm located at the Arizona State University Polytechnic Campus, and we're the College of Technology and Innovation. And we are purposefully sit between the other traditional colleges and schools, which gives us a little bit uh, more freedom to operate and try some innovative things. And so one of the things that we have really organized ourselves around, because our entire mission is to be focused on experiential education, authentic learning opportunities, uh, collaboration, teamwork, and really bringing and focusing on inspiration in student work so that we can address the next step in the process beyond moving students to choose STEM opportunities from high school up to college, but also to complete once we get them up into university level. We still are working very much against the grain as we work to retain students in engineering programs. And the College of Technology and Innovation has taken the position that a very strong piece of that is that we need to engage people in making, and making provides a very nice parallel, and I really enjoyed listening to Paloma talk about what making is trying to inspire, and it's all those things, the experiential, the collaborative inquiry-based design, and when you bring that up to the university level, it means giving people the opportunity to work on their own projects as well. Uh, so any, no luck on the slides, which is fine. But what I thought I would mention is one of the things that we've done, which uh, is interesting, is there are many universities, particularly any engineering program would say that they have labs or maker spaces of some sort, and same with design schools and design programs. We entered into a partnership with Tech Shop, which just opened on this past Saturday, so Tech Shop Chandler is open, and what's particularly unique about Tech Shop for us and Chandler is that it is both open to the community, of course, which is the Tech Shop model, as are most of the open maker spaces that we're talking about. But it essentially, for me, is a, an area and a place in which I've been able to outsource our labs. So we can't do all of our engineering training there, but we certainly can do about 75% of it. We can offer our product development programs there and our entrepreneurship programs there. And for me, that is a very unique bridge to cross as a university. Lots of universities have labs. They're generally not open to the public to use. And so you're missing something about the magic of the opportunity for connection and the spark of innovation that can happen when a 12-year-old or 13-year-old might be there along with uh, an adult or engineer from a local company along with local students. So for us, we're very excited about what the potential for a whole range of makers come together, whether that means for to echo something that Chris said, for form, formal learning or informal learning while they're making something that they're passionate about. Along those lines, we've launched a series of courses that are open university-wide no matter what the major. So now reaching beyond this just being about engineering education or science or technology programs. But we have courses that are accessible to all called Make Your Ideas Happen. Uh, one modeled after MIT Neil Gershenfeld's course called Make Just About Anything and Make Your Ideas Grow. So I believe that there is a great opportunity to, to both to tap into the spirit of the maker movement, which is essentially from the standpoint of what we're driving toward, our innovations, and connect that to the challenge that we face in higher ed of not only encouraging people to pursue STEM degrees, in particular engineering degrees, but also persist in those. And I certainly would be remiss if I didn't talk also about why this matters to us from the corporate partnerships. It's incredibly valuable to think about how we can provide open space for innovation where we're tapping into the community of creativity and inspiring young people to pursue these fields. But also, the things that we've seen are makerspace create a new interest and a renewed interest among young women. And their interest in creating and designing the things that they want to, which is really adding a completely new perspective to the types of projects 
that we see they want to work on rather than us defining those projects for them. So this self-guided inquiry, no matter where it goes. And we're very excited about the partnership with Tech Shop and other maker spaces that we're working with in the state of Arizona as we continue to extend this model. We've been very pleased to have the opportunity to work with uh, Maker Ed uh, as uh, core members of Maker Core because for us it's an opportunity to figure out how do we scale and move this beyond the physical footprint of the university, which is what Tech Shop also represents because it's off campus and extend it, in our case, statewide in Arizona. So we're doing that through Maker and Innovator Clubs. Uh, we'll be launching our first Maker and Innovator Academy this summer. We have a whole series of research projects that are really focused on understanding the maker movement and its relationship to young people's pursuit of engineering degrees in particular, but STEM areas in general. So I'll, I'll be here for questions if people have uh, questions for us. And I'm especially pleased to say that Joey, the marshmallow launcher, is from our backyard in Chandler, in fact, where Tech Shop is located. So we're really excited about what Joey's going to create next now that Tech Shop's open. Great. I'm going to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Mitzi. That was great. Uh, we are so proud that uh, we are partnering with you and that you are a member of our Innovation Task Force and love working with your, your team back in uh, Phoenix. Um, and uh, it is critical, as Tom said, that the, the post-secondary schools are engaged in this and we're looking at this in community colleges and universities. Um, so it's this is... Uh, Becoming a, a a a critical piece of the uh, of the ecosystem, and the, that brings us to the next section of the ecosystem, which is really where we started uh, at STEM Connector, looking for um, what's coming from the demand side. And uh, employers were looking at the labor market in the United States uh, and continue to look at the labor market and say we can't find what we need, uh, and have looked um, looked to get rather than blaming it on other people, a lot of companies. Um, have have, uh, have have really gotten engaged in the uh, discussion in a really productive way. Uh, our next two speakers are uh, Mark Greenlaw, who is with um, Cognizant Corporation, um, which is a company some of you may not know of, um, but Mark will tell you a little bit about what they do, I'm sure. Uh, and Carlos Contreras, who's um, from Intel Corporation, which is uh, really synonymous with um, uh, innovation in the United States and is largely responsible for um, a lot of the major technological accomplishments. So I will read their bios for you very quickly and uh, turn it over to them uh, and they can uh, share with you their story and uh, their commitment to making and uh, their corporation's commitment to this cause. Uh, Carlos Contreras is a U.S. Education Director for the Intel Corporation uh, and he develops in that role the U.S. Innovation, into education strategy working with others to drive education policy and change at the national level. He oversees Intel's education programs in the United States, which include grants to encourage excellence in math, science, and engineering in K-12 as well as higher ed, and the use of technology in the classroom. Prior to this role, Carlos spent 10 years uh, working in finance at Intel, including several rotations in the technology department and manufacturing divisions. Carlos has an MBA from Thunderbird and a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from the University of Arizona. He's a third-generation engineer and the proud owner of a 66 Mustang and likes to make furniture as a hobby. Uh, Mark Greenlaw is Vice President of Sustainability and Educational Affairs and the former CIO at Cognizant. Uh, he is responsible for developing, executing, measuring, and communicating programs that ensure Cognizant is acting in a sustainable and socially responsible manner. Key areas of focus include environmental impacts such as carbon emissions, waste, and water consumption, developing new and innovative partnerships with charitable organizations and NGOs, and advancing, advancing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education by working with universities and educational organizations. Mark oversees Cognizant's Making the Future STEM Education Initiative, which seeks to inspire young learners to pursue the STEM disciplines by creating fun, hands-on learning opportunities. Mark, why don't I turn it to you and then uh, to Carlos, and uh, then you guys can kind of um, Talk amongst yourselves, since I know you you work together. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Uh, appreciate the introduction. And you um, already 
uh, gave a brief overview of our Making the Future program. Um, and it was something that we actually launched back in uh, September 2011 at the World Maker Fair at the New York Hall of Science. And as you mentioned, uh, it seeks to inspire young learners in the STEM fields by creating fun, hands-on learning opportunities. And under the Making the Future program, we do three primary uh, things. First, we partner with like-minded nonprofits uh, providing financial in-kind and volunteer support to them. Organizations like the New York Hall of Science where we uh, uh, funded a makerspace there, uh, like Citizen Schools where we do a lot of work around STEM education, and of course the Maker Education Initiative that we're proud to help uh, co-found with Maker Media, Intel, and Pixar, um, and be a proud supporter of the Maker Corp program. Uh, we also run a very unique college scholarship program for makers where we offer up to 20 uh, scholarships of $5,000 per year and the sole criteria for winning these scholarships is to take a three-minute video of something uh, that one of the students has made and we judge it solely based on that criteria of their skills as a maker. And finally, uh, we have our Making the Future After School and Summer programs. We have funded over 35 programs that are either after school, summer, and in some cases in school at child serving organizations around the United States. And in fact, we just closed out our uh, 2014 grant application cycle that perhaps some of you uh, on the call may have applied for. And we're very pleased that we received over 160 grant requests for the 25 grants. And we'll be announcing the winners of that by January 1st. So in terms of you know, why the corporate interest in the maker movement, and I'll give my perspective on that, and then uh, Carlos can give his. Uh, you know, like most technology companies, we're in the uh, technology and business uh, consulting services business um, with over 170,000 employees around the globe, and we're constantly looking for more talent and concern about the future uh, pipeline of talent of STEM workers. And I won't repeat all the dire statistics about the STEM shortage, and I'm sure many of you on the on the on the uh, video are aware of them. Um, but you know, and more specifically, uh, we have three goals in our program. Uh, first, we want to help generate interest in STEM because we know from uh, various studies that interest uh, and not proficiency is a better indicator whether a child will pursue the STEM disciplines as they go through the educational pipeline. And second, uh, our second goal is that we really want to help close the achievement and opportunity gap, uh, getting more low-income minority and under, underrepresented populations interested in the STEM field. And the reason for that is fairly obvious. We want to have also a workforce that is much more diverse as these young people get interested in STEM, move through the educational pipeline, and then we hope that they join companies like uh, uh, Cognizant and Intel and others. And finally, uh, we really want to make sure that the uh, young people that are coming out of our educational system have uh, outstanding problem-solving skills, and we want to really spark innovation, uh, creativity, and entrepreneurship along with the core uh, STEM interest and STEM skills. And from our perspective, we think the maker movement and making is just the perfect platform uh, for doing, uh, achieving all three of those goals. Um, first, it's a very broad platform. It's a broad tent. And you know, it has activities that can attract you know, both boys and girls from you know, a wide, using a wide range of activities and from a wide range of backgrounds. Um, activities like you know, making musical instruments to play any kind of music, whether it's hip hop or, or, or rock or country, sewing uh, e-textiles, uh, building hydroponic uh, systems, making rockets or robots, or working with digital fabrication tools. There are just many, many types of activities that can appeal to a broad range of children and spark that interest in STEM and the arts. And the second part of making that really is attractive to us as a company is that artistic element. Um, you know, we often um, find that uh, having the maker movement can lure kids that have more of an artistic inclination into these types of programs and um, help improve their understanding of STEM and perhaps generate interest in STEM and, and, and get them on that track or just make them a better artist. We think that's important too. And so we think that that, that combining of arts and STEM that is really so uh, evident in the maker movement is a great tool for that. Um, and um, finally, you know, that, that combination of thinking about art and design and aesthetics is also, we think, really important to the technology uh, development process, which is really important to us at Cognizant. You know, we've seen from our experiences and our clients' experiences that the best products and services often come about when design and aesthetics 
are blended together with strong uh, technology and engineering skills and disciplines. So, you know, we really feel that the maker movement, by bringing those things all together, is just the perfect thematic platform for our STEM initiatives. So that's, I'll, I'll keep my remarks brief and, and hand it over to you, Carlos, to see if uh, you have a different view from the Intel perspective or want to uh, add anything to that. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, everybody. And I just noticed my name is on backwards. So I don't know if that's how it looks. Um, anyways, uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, Mark and, and the leadership uh, that he's shown in this space. Uh, Paloma's been done some fantastic work with the Maker Education Initiative, and these are really two folks that I, I really admire greatly for their passion and, and their willingness to share uh, what, they've, what they're doing and just the impact that they're having. Uh, in terms of Intel, uh, we've been a long-term supporter of STEM education. Over the last 10 years, we've invested over a billion dollars uh, in, in education. Uh, you guys might have seen our, our science fair competitions. Uh, and for us, making is, is, a, is a new area of interest. Uh, we started a couple years ago. Uh, we started small with uh, San Mateo Maker Fair, uh, partnering with uh, internally with our Intel Labs team, uh, which are the folks that have the uh, the anthropologists, the folks that are using at usage models, uh, not our technologists. And uh, with them, we, uh, we started developing some uh, educational activities. Uh, and what we find with, with the maker movement, as Mark talked about this, is the interdisciplinary nature of it that I think is really cool. Um, and today I'm, I'm in Boston. Uh, we're doing uh, a plan uh, with our Compu Intel Computer Clubhouses because we piloted a uh, maker summer camp uh, this summer, and it just took off. It's fantastic. We had uh, five pilot, five uh, clubhouses that we identified, and three of them came up voluntarily and saying we want to do it too. And the clubhouse is basically it's an after school uh, 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 mo model. It's mostly in, in the U.S. It's mostly in boys and girls clubs, and it was developed by MIT Media Labs, and they're here. And we're trying to figure out how can we scale the five pilots into a hundred club clubhouses around the world in two years. Um, and so uh, what we found with, with our science fair competitions, too, is the, the motivation is key here, right? Uh, and having kids that get interested in the subject uh, or in an area of interest just leads to all sorts of outcomes that you can't expect. Um, and uh, you, most of you have probably seen Jack Andreka. He's out there. He's our ISEF winner from last year, uh, invented a test strip for cancer. And one of his quotes that I love uh, uh, is, uh, it was, this is for pancreatic cancer, one of the quotes I love about him is, I didn't even know what a pancreas was before I got started. But he was motivated. And, I, and we see this in, in the maker movement. We see that motivation and that spark, and it kind of flips the traditional model uh, uh, a little bit in terms of our approach. Uh, and that all the skills that kids are learning, they're just not learning fabrication. They're really learning how to access a worldwide market of fabrication. Because if you can design something uh, and it's digital, uh, you can uh, you can make it and you can build it and you can market it and you can sell it. Uh, and Joey Huddy, who was mentioned earlier, is a case study of that. Sylvia Todd is another case study of, of, of somebody that's just doing this stuff. Where she's not only teaching kids the tools, but I think we're giving them access uh, to a new level of entrepreneurship for those that want to go there and for those that just you know, want to build something to show off, that's also a great platform. Uh, so in short, I think this is, uh, for me, this is very exciting. Internally, uh, within the company, uh, we, uh, last uh, last month, we launched a partnership with Arduino, uh, which is the, the board that is used in this community, and we're excited about that partnership. Uh, we have a, a new product coming out called Galileo Board, uh, which is Arduino compatible, and we're going to design uh, some more boards. So our technology, opening up our technology to uh, millions of kids, millions of users that haven't had access to our technology is very exciting for us. And so uh, nothing nothing but positive news. Our employee base is all fired up. I have 10 emails about curriculum that came in <laughs> the last 30 minutes from our employees. They're all excited about this stuff, and there's something about the culture, the openness of, of of the maker movement, I think, is is really great platform for kids. Mark, do you have anything else you want to add? Okay, guys, I'm gonna plug back in on my. Can you hear me, Carlos? Okay. 
Uh, guys, thank you so much, um, and uh, we will come back to you for questions. Um, I know that Intel has definitely been um, a long-time leader in, in just talking about some of the um, other uh, work that they're doing in um, education in terms of their competitions, and Jack and Draka, and Draka is uh, really just, I think, inspired a lot of uh, a lot of us to, to do great stuff. Um, we, uh, just looking, I, I did hear um, somebody, uh, I, I'm just looking at the, the feed, uh, and somebody said, where are the millennials in this conversation? So I think we're going to get a little closer to the millennials um, with our next speakers, um, and uh, and certainly, you know, we, we do want to hear from students, and uh, and, and we think this, there's a lot of potential. Um, one of uh, my good friends from, from high school, James Deck, is working on um, making and has done some work with Mark Greenlaw and uh, Maker Ed in, uh, in New York. And um, our next speaker is, is not necessarily doing stuff with uh, uh, Maker Ed yet. I'm hopeful that, that today, but um, uh, a couple years ago, I was, uh, well, about a year ago, I guess, was walking in uh, the Lakeview neighborhood in. Um, while I was there in Chicago for a wedding, and um, I was pulled in to the by um, by his friend to to rake leaves, um, or to put down uh, mulch uh, at the beginning of the school year, and uh, we started talking, and um, he started showing me this school in um, an urban center community school uh, that's just doing amazing things, and and really doing amazing things to to get the community involved in the educational community. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Ted Ted Ganchif um, with the Science and Entrepreneurial Entrepreneurship Exchange, uh, and uh, Ted co-founded C after spending eight years in education fundraising program and development. Working with Northwestern, Ted co-created the structure and plan for rebuilding Nettlehurst School in Chicago, an effort that gained national recognition as a model for reinvigorating programs, facilities, and public-private partnerships. Ted and his team have shared their experiences with approximately 100 schools in Chicago, providing advice and best practices through symposiums, workshops, and group consultations. So I will turn it over to Ted Ganship, the other Ted on this call. You're on. Good. Thanks for having me, Ted. Um, if I can just add 10 seconds to your story. Uh, when you walked by the school, we were shoveling wood chips. It was about 110 degrees. You were in a dress shirt, and you shoveled for about an hour. And I'm like, whoever that guy is, I've got to get to know that guy. Um, and then your name, Ted, too, which was a huge bonus, I thought. Um, so I'm going to run a few slides here. I'm going to try and, uh, and share the screen, if I can, and tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, in the elementary and middle school space. Okay. So the program is called the Science and Entrepreneurship Exchange. Um, as Ted mentioned, uh, we've been running this. We're in the third year now of our pilot. We've gotten an enormous reception here in Chicago. Um, we're in the context of, of making. We're really all about the bookend. So sort of, what are we going to make and why? Then we get into the actual engineering and and. Uh, and prototyping and, and building portion, and then we get into how do we get what we've made to the people who need it. Um, we want to get kids before they think STEM is scary or uncool, so we've really gone down uh, deep into the elementary levels and into the middle school so that they'll choose this stuff in high school and hopefully beyond that in their lives as well. Some of the problems we're trying to solve for, I think most anybody um, who's given a presentation today could, could talk through this slide, but you know, it's it's very hard to get kids engaged in STEM learning using the siloed approach that's been so prevalent um, and certainly was part of my education back when. So a lot of kids lose interest in STEM by the time they've left middle school. Um, the next stat is the one I think that troubles me the most, and some of this revolves around the idea of standardized testing and, and of kids as young as 10 years old taking tests that will determine their futures um, in high school and beyond. We've kind of taken the fun out of risk taking and taken the constructive out of failure. And because of that, kids are less attracted to taking risks and in fact become more afraid of it. We haven't really given teachers a good way to teach experientially, a good way to take um, that between the bells learning and kind of spread it out across the day. And here in Chicago, specific to our city, um, 
there is a percolation of entrepreneurship and invention that's happening here that has not taken place really over the last two to three decades. We've tried. This seems like the real deal, and we're hoping to be part of that wave of bringing Chicago look larger on the radar. Hey, Ted. Yeah. Uh, you might try sharing your screens, uh, your your screen using just the entire desktop because we can only see the one slide. Let's see if we can get that. I think the way we were doing it this morning. Oops, there I am. Don't see me. Yeah, and then just do the max. There you go. Perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. I'll hide. Okay. I'll, I will hide myself. Yeah. So the idea behind our program is we allow kids at the elementary and middle school level inside the school day, not as an after school program, but inside the school day, so every kid gets deep immersion into this to do real startups around real products that they have done market research on, that they have conceived, that they have done CAD work on. Um, and they're doing these projects with university mentors. Uh, right now we're working with Northwestern University. Again, we're in our third year with them. The Illinois Institute of Technology has just picked up the program as well, and we'll be launching with them next year to do hands-on entrepreneurship and engineering. This is not sitting in a classroom and listening to somebody tell you how to create a marketing plan or create a funding pitch or design a product. This is you jumping in and doing it just as if you were an adult in the real world and you're doing it with adults in the real world. Um, everything we build is standard aligned. Uh, it fits inside uh, all of the structures for the school to make it seamless to integrate. The way it works is the C identifies a university partner and that partner adopts a K through 8 school uh, as, as we talked about before, Nettlehorst student K through 8 school that Northwestern has adopted. And C provides all of the programming and all of the support to manage these programs uh, throughout the school day and throughout the school year. Some of the impacts we hope to have, and I heard some of the previous speakers talking about some of these. Um, in K-8 students, really the number one was, as I said before, is decrease that fear of risk taking, not only in academic settings, but in settings outside of the schoolroom, is to make it okay to fail as it is in real life. Um, to make it a badge of experience um, instead of something shameful. To let them understand that so much of life is about finding a resource and using that resource to solve a problem or connecting a web of resources instead of thinking you have to have all the answers in your own head. Uh, the most successful among us are the best at bringing together resources that are out in the world that can be useful to solving problems. Trying to understand why core studies are relevant to, to their future. Um, the example we always use is solving for X. You know, you talk to kids about solving for X, and if X doesn't pop up in their life very often, they're going to stop solving for X. And so when you do a math problem um, in isolation, it may be uninteresting to you, but when you do a math problem that is going to be part of a business presentation that is going to raise money for a product that you design and is going to determine the success of that project, you pay a lot of attention to that math problem. And then, of course, as this whole conversation has been about getting more enthusiastic about pursuing STEM and entrepreneurial paths uh, outside of our experience. For university students, and this is a tremendously important part of our program here in Chicago, um, nor the students in Chicago tend to do their learning here and they're working elsewhere. So we see migrations out to Boston and Silicon Valley and so forth. And the idea is with our professional mentors working alongside our university mentors and younger students, we create these first networks among university students so that they will make some of their first post-graduation calls here in Chicago instead of out of muscle memory going and calling the coast. And we've already seen that kind of working, and I'll show you an example or two of that. For teachers, we want to give them a complete program, a curricula set, and a methodology for teaching problem solving and constructive failure, because at the elementary level in particular, um, these solutions don't exist. We want the teachers to, and we're seeing it now in the third year, become proficient at teaching some of these in absence of the mentors or with more limited assistance from the mentors, both in the STEM and entrepreneurship sides. And for our professional mentors, you know, needless to say, most of the folks who get involved, whether it's an ad professional or a venture capitalist or whoever is assisting uh, the classroom, they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. But there is the idea that they are connecting with the best and brightest in Chicago. And in a city where there are a lot of unfilled jobs, 
yet a high unemployment rate, it's very nice to see that some of our uh, professionals are getting connected with some of our outstanding uh, college mentors. Now to bring it down a couple thousand feet, we're concentrating on four grades right now. And I'll walk you really quickly through what those look like. In the third grade, you learn engineering fundamentals, and that's how to make one of something. So if you have a great idea, what does it mean to get it out of your brain into 2D, out into 3D, and then ultimately into a tangible product. So we do material sciences, engineering fundamentals, the kids work on CAD, um, we do rapid prototyping. Some of this is done on the campus, and some of this is done at a facility within the school. Fourth grade, you've had a great idea, you've figured out you can make it into a tangible product, but what if you need to make it into 10,000 tangible products? So there, we advance and ladder up to mechanical engineering, um, more advanced CAD. We do plastic injection molding, both in uh, facilities off and in the school. In the fifth grade, you do your first real entrepreneurial project, and I'll show you some photos of this. This is everything soup to nuts from market research, identification of need, empathy with customer, um, how do we distribute and do logistics, how do we create a marketing pitch. Um, our kids have to go and raise money for their businesses, and that's real money raised from real investors where they create an investment pitch um, and get the same kind of questioning you would if you were out in the uh, out on Sand Hill Road doing it. And then in eighth grade, we have a product design um, firm adopt that class and work with them to do an end-to-end -end original product. And so here we're doing crowdfunding instead of a venture pitch, and I'll show you an example of a success we just had there last year. One important piece of this, and it gets back to sort of the making component of this conversation, is that we are building these centers in the schools. So for each of our university partner and their affiliated partner K-8 school, they'll get an applied learning center, which has a 3D printer, a laser cutter, a mill, and a desktop plastic injection molding machine, so that the kids are getting hands-on experience with these machines at every stage of their education, whether they're doing prototyping, whether they're actually doing their manufacturing, on the bottom left, you can see that's a fifth grader holding a desk organizer that was laser cut and was built for uh, the college market. On the right side, these are kids up at Northwestern um, getting exposure to uh, plastic injection molding and mold making. And these are some of the outcomes that we've seen in the program. I'm going to show you when we get off of this deck and I'm back on the camera. Um, our kids in the eighth grade had an outstanding success last year with, with one of their products. And these were some of the reactions. On the left, you'll see some of the comments that we got back in our surveying. Um, and keep in mind, none of these kids have even gotten into high school yet. But the fellow in the upper left there with the sketch tablet um, went through our program in eighth grade and walked up in front of a bunch of parent volunteers and tapped the president of the design firm on the shoulder and said, could I get a job with you this summer? And the president of the design firm was sort of taken aback but said, sure. So this guy got an internship for a complete summer in product development before he even reached freshman year of high school, which we thought was fantastic, and we'd like to see a lot more of that happening. On the right, uh, what you're seeing there is 1871, which is an incubator, a very large incubator here in Chicago that's been very successful in, uh, in growing small companies um, and drawing people into the entrepreneurial setting in Chicago. On the left is the, uh, is the CFO of the Obama campaign and the fellow who's got his arms crossed on the right. He was the chief innovation officer of the campaign. They're two of our uh, mentors, and they're there with Northwestern students. We set them off for the day after the work with the class so that they could go integrate into Chicago's entrepreneurial culture. And those students could not only see what's happening here in Chicago, but they could attach names, phone numbers, and email addresses um, to get in touch with after they graduate from school. On the bottom here, this is a fellow here in Chicago who won the Nifty, uh, which is a great organization that teaches business plan writing. He won the Nifty National Competition and was headed off to the White House for a product that allows you to take a baby's temperature through a uh, pacifier, and the thermometer glows, the pacifier glows red when the baby has a fever. Um, he had a business plan for it. He didn't have tangible prototypes, so we worked to get him visualizations and prototypes, and I think that shows the power of taking an idea into something you can hold in your hand um, as opposed to just leaving it up there in your head or in paper. And lastly, um, I think this is an outstanding story. The, the young woman at the lower left was crying before her in-school presentation for the eighth grade program and didn't want to go on stage. Her teacher um, did persuade her to go up and do that presentation. She hit it out of the park. 
And this is her over the summer presenting at the Industrial Design Society of America's National Convention in Chicago doing the keynote about her eighth grade program. And she said, if I hadn't done um, the C8 program, I wouldn't be here on stage today. So we were very proud of that. Here are some of the metrics we got out of the program. Up on the top, you'll see some of the students, the Northwestern students, working with some of the kids. On the left there, we have a day where a, a local Chicago candy maker comes in and shows kids how you mold candy for holidays into different shapes. And then at the tables right next to that, we do plastic injection molding, which is, is largely the same, and the kids love it. On the right, you see kids working there um, up at Northwestern with some of the mechanical engineering students. Anyway, 83% of the kids uh, said they had a greater desire to be an engineer. 100% of the kids recommended to their friends. I can say from being in that school all the time, this is the thing the kids talk about in their school day, in their school year. And the first day of school this year, at every grade that we participate in, they were saying, what are we doing for C this year? So it's been a great success. Um, the university students are completely hooked. Uh, we had a, a meeting to recruit mentors this year up at Northwestern. And I am not lying when I say 100% of the attendees signed up to be mentors, which was extremely gratifying. And this talks a little bit about that confidence that comes from knowing that you now better understand the world around you as it relates to product design, engineering, manufacturing. So how much did you know about designing and making products before you ran through our program? You can see the shift after these kids came out um, of, that, of that program and had done their own work. On the upper right is a post-it note wall, and that was actually when I get off this presentation and I show you these products, that was the initial uh, brainstorming session for a home organization product. So in eighth grade, the kids had to come up with a home organization product, uh, had to be made out of steel. We had a bunch of design um, constraints around it, and there were 600 of those little pieces of paper on the wall. So out of those 40 kids, 600 different ideas got posted on the wall during that session. Again, we're trying to get demystify STEM. We're trying to demystify entrepreneurship for very young kids. We want to get them before they select out of this. Uh, here you'll see that 70% of the C students told their parents, and this was through a parent survey, not a student survey, of an increased desire to go to college. And needless to say, the parent demand has been very strong. Um, so where we stand right now is we've gotten calls from around the country saying, you know, we want to implement C in our school, and our response is we are in build mode. We're right now creating um, and professionalizing the programs and the curriculum so that we can serve up all that demand, uh, both here in Chicago and across the country. So if I can take off my screen sharing. Am I back on camera, Ted? You're there. I was muted. Great, Ted. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's very serendipitous. I just found the picture on my phone uh, from from the day that we were out there, uh, and it's crazy uh, just how worlds collide. So, um, thank you very much, Ted. And uh, I'm gonna to hide you and bring up our next speaker. Uh, is much closer, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll hear again from Ted Ganshiff at uh, at the end. Uh, our next speaker um, was introduced to us um, by our good friend at Teach for America, and seems to pretty much have, in a very short time, gotten to know everybody in uh, the STEM education and, and hands-on inquiry uh, project-based learning space, um, and is is just north of us is Andrew Coy. Uh, who's the uh, executive director, and I would guess you can say founder, right, of the Digital Harbor Foundation. Andrew is an educator, technologist, mentor, and entrepreneur interested in bridging the gap between education and technology. He is passionate about educational equality and dedicated to reinventing education to empower students to take their place in the 21st century digital workforce workplace. Creator of the Digital Harbor Foundation Tech Center, and a key player in the Baltimore EdTech system. I will turn it over to Andrew. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, so it's a, it's a pleasure to, um, to be joining and talking with all of you today. Uh, you know, just a, a couple points about my background. I was a, a classroom educator who 
uh, saw a need for uh, for some different innovative approaches in the after school space. I was teaching actually one day and I told the kids uh, I could get you a job right now building a website for a client. And these were inner city kids in Baltimore, uh, a number of whom didn't even have internet at home, and yet after school they were sticking around learning web development and, and actually sending PayPal invoices to clients uh, and different types of work. So you know, out of, out of the after school space I was able to develop uh, a number of initiatives and, and opportunities for youth that that just, uh, you know, on the cutting edge, it takes a, a little bit too long, uh, perhaps, uh, for curriculum to trickle down. And while it is getting more and more widespread adoption, I think the after-school space plays and can play an incredibly important role in developing models that work uh, and then uh, developing ways for, for us to spread those uh, further. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did uh, here when... Uh, about two years ago, the the city was shutting down a number of rec centers that had gone from uh, well over 100, 125 rec centers uh, 40 years ago in, in the city of Baltimore to 50 rec centers two years ago, and they were shutting down about half of those. Um, and that's where I came uh, to say we should do something different uh, than shut down a rec center. We should actually turn a rec center uh, into a tech center. And and you know, with my background. Uh, in, in being a history student, uh, originally a, a history teacher, I looked into that and I said, why is it that we had so many rec centers that we you know, don't have them anymore? And, and it really seemed to me that a rec center fit into kind of a factory age uh, model of the economy where uh, you know, the, the need was for a physically fit, able-bodied workforce and uh, you know, extended daycare options for second shift workers and, and their kids. Uh, but those needs don't exist in the same way, and instead our economy has shifted tremendously. Uh, and, and the types of things that we need now are all the things that everyone's been talking about, and that Ted gave some excellent examples of, of students doing things. You know, it's about innovation, grit, determination, uh, you know, and, and all of these things around uh, new types of technology. So, uh, you know, if you look at the actual model of a school, though, it really is formed after uh, a factory. I mean, here you see on the left uh, the Gillette factory on the top, and that's a high school in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, you know, they, they really look the same, and in fact, they follow many of the same sort of, you know, bells and timelines and uh, seat times, like you're on a conveyor belt. And, and as uh, uh, folks like Sir Ken Robinson talk about, you know, it's as though your date of manufacturing, you know, matters uh, to your learning, you know, class of 2015 or 2016, uh, much more than, than other factors uh, of learning. But if you look on the right, you see, you know, a, a lab, uh, a place of learning where failure is a stepping stone to figuring it out, uh, and it's only a failure if you fail to improve uh, and, and, and give up, uh, you know, and you see... Uh, Here's a, a student that was working and built their own 3D printer actually in eight days uh, during our summer maker camp, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Uh, but we turned an old rec center that was being shut down into a tech center and really took a look and said, you know, during the day, what can we do? And, and we're still building out these programs. We're not even a year old uh, in terms of running the rec center, uh, now tech center. Uh, we're about two years old as an organization. But, uh, you know, during the after school, we do uh, youth tech workforce development. In the evening time, we do uh, family-centric or, or community-centric uh, activities. We have a family maker night coming up and some other types of things I'll, I'll uh, get into just in a second. Uh, but this is what the, the South Baltimore Rec Center looked like when we inherited it a year ago this month. Uh, it was in dire need of, of some real attention, um, and, and it was... You know, about two, two and a half months of, you know, long days clearing stuff out, cleaning it up before we were able to reopen it in January uh, as the Digital Harbor Foundation Tech Center and begin programs there. Um, you know, and we, we did a number of, of programs uh, during the first semester, and we were really excited to be part of the inaugural uh, Maker Education Initiative Maker uh, Core member uh, site, and through that program we ran uh, four two-week summer camp sessions where students learn things like circuits and Arduinos, whether it was the Makey Makey uh, or, or a little bit more advanced depending on the age group. Uh, they also learn 3D printing in a session, uh, making everything from uh, cookie cutters using uh, you know, websites that, that help make that easy for the younger kids, or Tinkercad for some of the, the older projects. Uh, they did game development, uh, learning uh, hard coding through uh, the Lua, Lua language and Corona SDK for iOS and Android 
app development, and they rounded out the, the summer with some aerial pursuits where they actually built their own quadcopter uh, 3D printing parts and, and combining different components. Um, so here are some photos from, uh, from the summertime, you know, just really turning the space into uh, an innovative hub in the after school and summertime. Um, you know, and, and here on the right, uh, I'll talk about Darius for a second. He uh, came to us uh, in our first semester of programs and it was always there, but but didn't really have a specific thing he was interested in. Uh, he just knew he liked technology, and as many kids, you know, are they they like technology, but they couldn't articulate how to make that a career or where they're going to go with that. Uh, and and what he did uh, one day is uh, walked into our office when we had just got a kit uh, for a printer bot, and we said, you know, you want to help us build this this kit. So he went ahead and tackled that project, and it took him about six weeks, where he's just coming in. Uh, an hour or two a day working on it, uh, got stuck a lot, uh, wished he had more support, more help, uh, but one of the things we wanted him to do is to build it himself, and so kept giving him encouragement, and the day that it printed something was a transformational day for him. I, he, he made something that could make other things. Uh, so he since has, has built or been a part of building four uh, printer bots, uh, and the last one he built was actually done in, in under eight hours, uh, and he was teaching another high school uh, class or, or, or after school program that came to our space. He was teaching them how to build it. Uh, and so he's, he's gone on and, and has done quite a bit with that. But like I said, we are you know, one year into our programs. You can see on the left what uh, the space looked like a year ago and, and now a little bit of, of what it's like on the right. But you know, one of the, the things that we really care a lot about is having fun uh, and, and having opportunities for youth to develop these skill sets, be connected to mentors in the industry, uh, to work uh, you know, alongside them on real projects uh, and not, um, uh, not on uh, you know, worksheets or, or other types of assignments. But as we look at the larger picture uh, in education, we, we want to be a, a little bit of an R&D lab that can help figure out how do you solve some of these, these difficult problems uh, and then scale those out? Uh, because a lot of educators are saying, you know, how, how do you do this? Uh, when I talked to the head of the, the city schools here, uh, as we were launching some of these initiatives, you know, his comment to me was, I have 84,000 kids I have to think about. Uh, you know, how do I do this at scale? And so by stepping out of the school day, we, we've been able to show uh, without the risks that are associated with high stakes testing, uh, you know, how to do this, uh, to refine the model, uh, and, and we see tremendous potential for these informal uh, STEM learning experiences to, to really uh, give youth opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have or, or be comfortable taking, uh, taking upon themselves. For example, uh, if, I mean, if you look at, at any of the, the major tech company you know, uh, founders and, and CEOs, uh, it was something they did outside of the school day, outside of the class, that really uh, deepened uh, their, their passion and their drive uh, it ignited their, their interest in a topic, and, and yet what are we doing currently to formally support informal STEM? Uh, and, and I think the answer is really you know, seen in, in individuals on this panel uh, that, are, that are talking from, from the perspective of, of both industry and policy, uh, and, and more recently with the last two of us on the ground level of, of kids doing these things. So you know, what I'm interested in are, are helping support others that, that will say, hey, there's this space uh, here, you know, but we need, we need support uh, and, and help figuring out how to turn this space, this rec center, or this uh, unused or underutilized facility into something more. And if you think back to 100 years ago when Andrew Carnegie uh, really helped uh, spread you know, the library system, one of the ways he did it was went, went to you know, cities and said, you provide a building and space, and we'll fill it up with, uh, with books. And, and I think if we could do something similar where we take you know, existing spaces such as rec centers or, or other spaces and, and say, you know, let's reimagine how this can fit into the economic imperative uh, and let's, let's find a way to, to create an uh, create innovation zone or a, a way for kids to, to explore and develop these passions uh, and, and have you know, tech companies come together with, with local and, and state and, and national government uh, and, and the communities to create uh, opportunities that are low barrier to entry, 
uh, that develop interests and, and help students learn what they do or, or do not love uh, and, and, and you know, pursue their own, their own pathways into you know, high-paying tech careers, uh, you know, which as somebody who works a lot with inner-city kids in Baltimore, you know, my number one goal for them is to find their way uh, in, in to becoming a productive, uh, happy, you know, uh, you know, member of society that's that's not in the same cycles that a lot of them grow up in, where their their streets aren't, uh, you know, a, a safe place for them to be, uh, or they just don't see a lot of of opportunities around them. But they have all of the drive, desire, passion, grit uh, if you give them half a chance. So that's that's what we we love to do is is to help uh, help them along their path towards towards having fun with technology for for a living. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, that was awesome. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting up there again and seeing the progress. I uh, went up with our friends from Tata Consultancy Services in, uh, when was that, in um, November, October? Yeah, it was just a month ago. Yeah, just a month ago. Uh, and it's amazing, I mean, just to think that that, ex that facility is less than, uh, is less than a year old um, is, uh, is is, is mind-blowing. Um, so we will um, you have an opportunity here from Andrew questions. Uh, uh, Dean Montoya had to leave us, um, and as did uh, Carlos Contreras um, from Intel. Um, but uh, I will turn it, I'm going to send it back to the West Coast um, for Paloma and uh, to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Kip Bradford. Okay, great. Well, um, it gives us great pleasure to have welcomed Kip Bradford to the Maker Education Board of Directors last week, and we're really proud because we really believe that Kip exemplifies what we're trying to do here at Maker Education Initiative. He's an engineer, an entrepreneur, an inventor, uh, an, an educator, um, just having um, finished a, a term of teaching at Brown University and he's created toys for a toy company. So this is really exciting work. Um, we believe he represents the community and represents what young people can be inspired to do. So I'm going to hand off to him because um, he's been involved in the maker movement far longer than I have and also sits on the technical advisory board for Make Magazine. Thank you, Paloma. And uh, thank you, Ted, and everyone who's who's uh, really given a lot of perspective about making and the impact of making across a bunch of domains. And what's really exciting for me is to see the uh, what had been kind of a small community of people who were really excited about making things and tinkering and experimenting with technology um, transform the broad culture of America back to... Uh, as uh, author Jack Hitt had had uh, called um, essentially a nation of inventors, a nation of makers, um, making, uh, as was said in the beginning of, of the Hangout, is as American as apple pie. And I think that that's really an important thing to, to reflect on. Um, what happens when we go from a nation of consumers to a nation of makers? I think there's... Uh, just looking at the diverse population of people who are participating in our Hangout right now, we've got a uh, broad swath of government officials uh, at state and federal and local levels. We have people in the education domain. We have uh, Cognizant and Intel, um, some of our largest corporations participating. Um, we have nonprofits who are looking at, at underserved youth, educators. It's a fantastically rich community of, of people who are engaged right now and, and what that says to me is that making is really something that cuts across domains, it cuts across uh, cultural and economic boundaries and is something that I think really uh, uplifts people and, and it's exciting to me um, because it's what I've been doing from the day I put together my first Lego set. Uh, to today where where I mentor and advise uh, startups, um, I educate youth and, and adults, um, and I actually just stepped off an airplane from Shenzhen, uh, China, where a lot of the products that we use today, iPhones, uh, laptop computers, um, our appliances, a lot of those products are, are made, but what I'm seeing is a shift um, where a lot of the, the things that, that 
traditionally might be made in large volumes in China, we're starting to see a lot of new products uh, and Kickstarter projects that are funding companies that might be making a thousand of something uh, locally. And what's, what is cool and new about that is uh, it's really energizing a new sector of entrepreneurship and um, outlets like The Economist magazine have talked about how a new industrial revolution is happening uh, through the maker movement where we used to see uh, a lot of high technology startups that were um, doing software, web applications, iPhone applications um, and that's where all the startup energy was and that's where a lot of innovation was happening but now there's much, much more innovation happening once again in America uh, with physical products. Um, and in a lot of ways, these products are so fundamental to our everyday lives. Everything we interact with from the fork you use to eat breakfast to uh, whatever mode of transportation you use to get to school or get to work are being transformed by individual makers or small groups of tinkerers who have ideas and today have the tools to actually uh, implement those ideas and, and see them to fruition. Um, the, the barriers to entry are, have, been, um, have very much been lowered with Arduinos and 3D printers. Um, CNC machining is becoming more accessible. The software for making um, tools like AutoCAD and SolidWorks, um, Eagle are readily accessible and inexpensive, whereas those tools might have cost $25,000 10 years ago. Um, some of them are even free. Um, Autodesk announced at the Hardware Innovation Workshop uh, a handful of months ago that, that for startups under $100,000 a year of revenue, uh, they'd be giving away their tools for free. So there's, there's a lot of democratization of access to the tools of making, um, which, is, which is something that really uh, is helping the, the maker movement surge ahead and transform local economies, transform people's lives, um, transform education. And I really think that the, the energy that the White House is putting into uh, maker education is, is valuable, um, not just for STEM education, but one thing that's really important to remember is that, that we make things because we're interested in the things. We're not making things necessarily because we're interested in science. Um, I like to, to uh, help put things into context by reminding people that we don't build bridges in the middle of the ocean. And the reason we don't build bridges in the middle of the ocean is that the whole point of having a bridge is to get people from one place to another. So the reason that we make stuff is because we want something. We want to create something of value for ourselves, for our friends, and in doing so, when people uh, are engaged in maker activities, they're really putting technology in the social context and understanding why the technology exists, what the technology is used for, and they see the big picture of science and math and art and creativity and innovation. Um, and, and that's really where the education takes hold because kids, instead of learning, say, physics, um, physics is a wonderful, beautiful thing, but if you're intimidated by physics or calculus, uh, it becomes much, much, much more engaging when that's put in the context of, oh, maybe you can make a hovercraft, maybe you can make a Segway, maybe you can make a robot, um, maybe you can make your light-up fish tank. Um, those contexts are what creates the engagement that keeps uh, kids and parents fully focused on uh, STEM and, and arts. So uh, I, I just want to finish by saying that, that it's exciting to see the maker movement spread beyond um, the 25,000 people that came to the first maker fair. Um, to the millions of people who are excited about 3D printing, excited about uh, Arduino, and excited about Intel Galileo, um, and the new products that everyday makers are creating and sharing with each other through Kickstarter and, and through Instructables, and 
lots of platforms that are that are uh, out there today. Um, and it's also exciting to see making transforming engineering education uh, at places like Georgia Tech and and uh, Arizona and um, the Cal education system and lots of other universities that are picking up on this and saying, wait a second, we can get our engineers not just uh, a strong education, but also really get them excited about engineering. Um, it's it's a difficult field sometimes, and it's easy to lose sight of, of why it's valuable and why it's exciting, and um, getting people engaged with making really puts that excitement uh, back into the, the hard work of becoming a really good engineer. So um, I'm excited to be part of this, and I'm excited that everyone here is, is joining in the Hangout and hopefully uh, helping to grow the maker movement. So I'll put it back to Ted. All right, Kip, thank you. Well, um, I'd like to keep, I'm going to bring everybody back um, because it's question time. Um, as we said before, um, uh, and Kip, you know, please uh, come and visit us in, in D.C. And, and Paloma as well. It's Jackie's not. Hi, Jackie. Um, uh, Chris, there you are, and Andrew. So everybody who I just added back on, you're going to need to unmute yourself uh, in order to be heard. But we still have... Um, Ted Ganchiff is still joining us from, uh, as you remember, with the the, uh, the SEE program in Chicago that um, is very interesting. Mark Greenlaw from Cognizant is still with us. Chris Rowe from California STEM Learning Network. Andrew Coy, and then uh, Paloma and Kip. Um, and then if you do have questions, folks, um, the remember the hashtag is Maker, S-T-E-M. Um, I also want to let somebody say hi. Who's sitting right next to me um, is our CEO, Edie Fraser. Let me look. Thanks, Ted. I just think that the entire world should be listening to all of you. So thanks to Ted for the leadership for STEM Connector, Paloma, all of you, and we can just take each one of you. We have learned so much in the last hour and a half, so we want the world to know that we're really moving to Maker and that you guys are driving it. And we just want to all learn how you're changing America to the good through Maker. Thank you. Okay. And I'm back. Um, thanks, Edie. Uh, so um, Tommy uh, Cornelis, who's our social media guy, if you ever see at Twitter, at uh, STEM Connector, he is the, the genius behind this. So I have a question here from um, at Science Mentor. Um, and hopefully, Tommy, you can keep feeding me some. Uh, how to start a community-based maker lab that is open and designed for kids? Uh, and that might be a great question for Andrew, um, since that's what you've kind of done. And maybe, Kip, you've uh, got some experience there, too. Sure, yeah, I'll add a couple of thoughts. Um, I think, first and foremost, you have to find partnerships. You know, if you, if you can find a space, uh, for example, uh, this rec center here is physically attached to an elementary school. And when it was being shut down, I went to the school district, uh, and especially being a teacher, I knew quite a few people, and, and I told them what I wanted to do with it, and I told them enough times and explained it enough and, uh, and did enough uh, you know, thoughtful kind of planning, they were able to, to take the space over from Parks and Rec and turn around to me and provide the space uh, you know, free of rent and utilities, so as, as in kind, uh, they gave us this 5,000 square foot facility, which has really been uh, instrumental in us being able to do what we do. Uh, you know, I, I was just a teacher. I didn't have a background in, uh, in necessarily raising money for a nonprofit and, and running one, and so I needed uh, those types of partnerships, and, and whether it's pro bono uh, legal work or whether it's, you know, others. But, but I really think that if you can connect to the like-minded institutions like Maker Ed or others that, that have these uh, so structural supports, and if you can connect with local organizations and partners uh, who who will take a chance and believe on, on your idea? Uh, you know those types of, uh, of of actions will help you build something and start small. Don't don't be you know afraid to start an after school club, uh, and, and then bring people to that to show them uh, to then build something bigger uh, and constantly be iterating, making it better uh, and improving it. You know we talk a lot about the design process with with youth. We need to also be comfortable with that as an organizational strategy where. You you know you're not uh, you're not set in your way for for a year and a half. You you map out strategies, 
but you don't hesitate to adapt and change as necessary. So uh, it sounds like a lot, a lot, a lot of the skills are, are the same things that would make a successful maker, right? Yeah. So, uh, Kip, why don't you jump in and then maybe Ted, you've got something to add. Uh, a quick couple uh, thoughts. Make Magazine uh, and Maker Media usually host a number of uh, meetups throughout the year, especially around Maker Fair times, about making your own makerspace. And I highly encourage you, if you're interested in starting a makerspace, uh, to get in touch with Maker Media folks, get in touch with the Maker Education Initiative, and, and uh, look for a workshop near you about making a makerspace. Uh, and, and I'll also put out a challenge to uh, universities with engineering programs. Uh, if you want to have community engagement, then makerspaces are a great way to get your students out in the community and also get your communities, uh, your local communities engaged with your schools of engineering. Um, that's that's a, a big untapped resource to keep uh, where where the students can share what they're learning um, with the local the local kids, and in doing so, it really helps cement the uh, skills and knowledges and knowledge that the engineering students are are picking up, um, and also gets people excited about what they're doing and what they're learning from, from both directions. But definitely check out um, the Making Makerspace workshops, and I think there might also be uh, some, some publications that Maker Media has put together on Making Makerspace. Awesome. Um, Ted, did you want to add anything to that? I think I would just echo We've gotten such an enormous amount of help from Northwestern, uh, their mechanical engineering school, and initially we're able to use their facilities and their students um, and their faculty to help us understand better what it was we were really looking for in the space in the first place. And I'd throw in as well, from a partnership standpoint, um, the Chicago Public Library has just put a facility downtown and is now talking to us about putting um, spaces in the community library so that during the day, the C program, would get use of those facilities, and in after school hours, the community would get used. So again, I would just echo the partnership portion. And Ted, I, I would just yeah, I saw you nodding your head, Paloma. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to add that um, we have an application open now for new host site partners. This is how you become part of our community of practice. Uh, this is how you learn from folks like Andrew Coy at Digital Harbor Foundation and Mitzi Montoya at ASU. Um, if you apply by December 11th, you can be a host site, which means you're part of the Maker Core community of practice. You're going to work with us to identify and hire Maker Core members. We want to double our footprint in 2014, and so this is the time to jump in and be part of that effort. Awesome. Thanks, Paloma. Well, I, I, the, Ted, yeah, Joe, sure, go ahead, Mark. I, I do have, I want to get you in the next question, but go ahead. Uh, one, one thing I just want to add about the space question, um, we like to say we, to a lot of our grantees, don't let the lack of a space be an excuse for not running a program for kids. We've seen a lot of our programs be run in temporary space, you know, in the a room rented out of a church or even a restaurant or people's homes, and it's not ideal to do that because you have to schlep the equipment and then the gear and all in and out each week. But, you know, sometimes people are hung up on having to have a space. Idea, it's, it's better when you do have a space, but if you don't, it's not, a, you know, I always like to say don't let the space, lack of space be an excuse for not running a maker program for children. And the second point is uh, we work with the New York Hall of Science on creating a, a guide called a blueprint for young makers, which is accessible on uh, both the Maker Ed website as well as the New York Hall of Science Design Make Play site. So that's another resource for people trying to start programs for young makers. Great. There's also a, a free playbook on makerspace.com that gets you started on how to develop your space, what tools to buy. Also, we have a free playbook um, for starting a young makers club, and it defines the roles of the club managers and people in the community and how to get started with your group. Um, and uh, for those who don't have a 3D printer or fancy equipment, you can still make. There are a lot of really low-tech ways to get engaged in making that have nothing to do with those tools. Um, we just moderated a panel yesterday at the California STEM Symposium with six teachers who are running maker programs in the classroom during the school day, 
and most of them said they have a 3D printer in the classroom, but it's just for the parents, just to kind of check it off the list that they are technologically savvy, but it has a thick layer of dust on it, and they never use it. In fact, they do everything else before they get to that. Awesome. Oh, Paloma, thank you uh, for that. And I, It seems like there's a lot of resources out there. I think our next uh, question moves us into, um, you know, there is this idea of, of maker spaces um, as a as a sort of experimental area of education and, and um, one that we eventually want to turn into something that uh, can be part of the way education looks in the next 15, 20 years maybe as soon as that. Uh, and we all know how challenging educational reform is in the United States. Um, I thought maybe, Chris, I could uh, uh, tap into you. It looks like you're muted still, so make sure when you start talking you unmute yourself. There you go. Um, and the question I see is, uh, how do you turn maker maker education initiatives into sustainable programs? And I know, Paloma, this is a lot of what you're looking at in Mark, so maybe, uh, Chris, you can start off and then we can kind of move, move around. Yeah, well, that's a great question um, and, and something that we're thinking a lot about, and I, I can't claim that we've got the answer to that, but I, I do see, you know, some really great opportunities of, of leveraging the real exciting grassroots work that's happening with Maker, with the rollout, especially here in California, there's so much energy and excitement around the Common Core rollout and the soon-to-be rolling out Next Generation Science Standards, and I see such really exciting alignment, particularly around the um, practices, science and engineering practices, the engineering design piece that's going to have to be a, a big part of, uh, the, of the formal school day going forward. So. Uh, like I say, I don't think we have the answers yet, and I think it's a great, uh, a great conversation to really think about how, as those major initiatives roll out, you know, here in California with 6.3 million uh, public school students, how do we leverage some of the really fun and cool, exciting stuff that's happening in this kind of grassroots maker space uh, as we roll this out uh, with teachers and with students? So um, I'd love to continue the conversation and hear other people's ideas about that. Paloma, Mark? Sure. You know, what we learned through MakerCore is, you know, at the beginning we were focused on training young people to work with children and work with museum, library, and school staff to, um, you know, embed making in the programs. But what we learned through the process is the staff at those sites also took our online training and they also began to engage in making and they realized that they too could identify themselves as makers, that they too were welcome in that community and you can come from a background where you've just done um, art in the physical world, you weave, maybe you sew, but then you can add some other components to that and begin to connect these digital tools we have now to your work and so it's a very inclusive community I think that helps build sustainability um, I also think that when people collaborate in order to engage others in making that builds community um, also um, in the work of making the teacher is often a facilitator and takes a back seat and allows the students to really drive the work and the more that that can be done the more open-ended it can be the more inclusive it can be of all the voices in the room the more sustainable the programming is and I know that Andrew's done this where um, those who have taken the maker camp classes then graduate and become peer-to-peer -peer mentors and that's also a really powerful way to sustain making in the community Thanks. Um, Mark, do you have anything to add? And then, and, and Andrew, I'll... Uh, I sure. Uh, from a funding uh, perspective. There are many elements of sustainability. Uh, one is funding, and so Cognizant has tried to lead by example in terms of offering various funding models in terms of after-school program grants, funding MakerEd itself, funding Maker Course sites, and also funding grants for resources, both, I mentioned, the New York Hall of Science Playbook, as well as uh, funding an, uh, an evaluation with the Lawrence Hall of Science around the, the benefits of maker programs for youth. So, you know, we'd love to see other, uh, you know, leading corporations, you know, follow suit in that as, as some of our other partners at MakerEd are already doing. And so that is certainly one source of uh, sustainability. But we also think that local partnerships and also pairing up with existing child-serving organizations who have, you know, stable sources of funding. We see a lot of programs with 4-H, um, so they can be a great partner. A lot of programs with Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, you know, the Science and Children's Museums around the country can be great, great partners. And so, you know, the collaboration of those partnerships can help uh, ensure that programs can be sustainable. Great. Andrew? 
Yeah, just a couple thoughts. You know, from the perspective of a small nonprofit that didn't have, you know, uh, an endowment or some sort of, you know, major underwriting initially, you know, it's been a hustle, right? And and one of the ways that we've found sustainability or on a path to sustainability, uh, you know, is first off, yeah, tapping into all of these amazing support systems that do exist and, and are developing, but also looking at where is an education, where is the funding? It's during the school day, and what does the school need? That, that we in the maker community can provide them. You know, high quality professional development for teachers that, that need to get away from teaching to the test and start developing these other methods but don't know how to do that. Uh, our, our instructors and our mindsets can provide a, a, you know, incredible value add to those programs. And, and, the, and schools do have professional development dollars. They also have dollars for curriculum. Uh, and, and they're constantly needing you know, better and better curriculum that integrates this technology because taking a test on a computer is not ed tech. You know, that's, uh, that's a tool. It's like taking a, pe a test with a, a pencil and calling that, uh, you know, using technology too. Uh, so they need what we are developing and, and the more that uh, the innovative leaders in this informal STEM uh, can, can find ways to tap into some of those, those funding streams, I think the, the more sustainable uh, we will be and you know, and, and the last thing I'll say is, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for formal support for informal STEM. You know, meaning that we need uh, some of the same types of dollars that go into school day, going into these after school and extended learning options, but not just simply making school day longer. We don't need more of the same. You know, we don't. Uh, if you if you read Will Richardson, he talks about this faster ship that goes across the U.S. in 1954 called the U USS United States. It was 19 hours faster than any ship up to that point, but nobody's ever heard of it because you know the the jetliner went across the ocean you know two years prior. So uh, we need a different system, not a better one. And what we're doing here and the conversations we're having are part of that different system. Uh, and we need just to continually bring in folks. Uh, you know, and I think this call represents a wide range of supports, and we need to spread this, as, as Edie was talking about, to, to all the others who aren't here uh, on, on the call, on the panel, and, and continue to, to, move, to push this forward. So, Awesome. Uh, and Andrew, I, I, I grabbed this, uh, my um, make a Digital Harbor 3D printed uh, card holder that you all gave me. It was pretty cool. Um, so I have a couple more questions that, um, you know, and I think that is one of the pieces where it's, um, you know, this idea of funding streams, formal, informal, where does this fit? And, um, you know, it sounds like it can fit anywhere. You just need to be creative and, um, and, and persistent uh, is what I'm hearing a lot of and resourceful. Um, I, you know, I had a one of the folks who was sort of, um, I, I heard earlier, uh, I was, saw earlier was commenting on Google tweeted us, given the current climate, how do these ideas equate to career value or, or value in the labor market? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, does anybody want to take a crack at this? <laughs> I, I'd love to take a crack at it. <laughs> um, I, it my other, one of the other hats I wear is I do, I oversee all our Cognizance U.S. college recruiting. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like more that we like to hear from a new college recruit as to talk about, you know, what they make. Uh, you know, rather than just having a resume, we'd love to see a portfolio of the kinds of products um, uh, they've developed, whether they're software products or engineered products, and so when someone can talk about real life experiences, what they made, I mean, that's that's far better than than what you're going to gleam on a resume. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, having been faculty in engineering at Brown University and uh, being the CTO of a bunch of startups. Um, uh, the the skill set that people develop when they're engaged with with contextual science exploration and technology exploration um, are very very broad based. So their their social skills, you know, communication skills, their engineering, uh, STEM skills, their creativity, um, their innovation. And those last two, I think I, I really want to put the emphasis, the emphasis on. Um, when you just learn technology uh, out of context or science out of context, it does not provide the kind of uh, thought flexibility that, that is really required for 21st century uh, innovation and employment. Um, seeing the kids that, that uh, I worked with as an educator 
um, go out into the job market. Um, one of my uh, student that I mentored is uh, was the associate director of Smart Design Worldwide, one of the top product design firms. Uh, another student did a million dollar plus Kickstarter campaign for the world's thinnest watch. There's a lot of a very broad based thinking that that covers a lot of areas: design, um, entrepreneurship, and really getting kids started thinking broadly uh, is probably one of the most valuable things we can do because who knows what kind of technologies are going to hit the world in 20 years and the preparation uh, requires creativity, requires innovative thinking, requires open-mindedness and requires the ability to solve really nebulous, really poorly formed problems. And that's what making is all about. It's getting your hands dirty and saying, I'm going to try 30 different ways to figure out a solution to something. I'm going to fail at 29 of them. And I'm going to develop a process of inquiry and exploration. And that, regardless of, of the kind of career you enter, um, that skill set is just fundamental to, to being able to succeed in a rapidly changing world. Yeah, we, you know, it, it's interesting, Kip, but I just will go. I, I work with a lot of companies here at STEM Connector. We work with, we have like 70 members, and, uh, and we, we have these conversations a lot. Uh, and and one of the things where, you know, is that, that, that the challenges are becoming more and more, for lack of a better word, challenging. I mean, one of the initiatives we're working on is uh, feeding the world, you know, is increasing the food supply, decreasing food waste. And uh, you know there were, there's going to be a billion more people um, by the year 2050 in the world, and all the easy stuff has pretty much been done. So um, I thought, think that's a, a really great way to, to put it. Um, I think we have one more question, and I just want to get it in there because it really is. We have time, like three minutes, uh, and, and just everybody, this will be archived on our website, on YouTube, on our plus probably on the Maker Ed site. Um, and I'd like to announce that we will. Um, I, I'm going to propose to Paloma that we partner together to uh, put some of these resources together on the STEM Connector site, um, and, and we can get those out via STEM Daily. Uh, and just, a, again, thanks to Cisco for sponsoring this, uh, and uh, also to my colleague Tommy Cornelis, who's been live tweeting and, um, and, and feeding me questions. So thanks, Tommy. Um, so uh, who do you turn to to help plan a grassroots makerspace for kids? Um, I, no, actually, I'm sorry. We already kind of did that one. That was another one. Could, this is the one that I was thinking. You have? Do you have any ideas on how to start a makerspace in rural settings, or in metro areas that are are not located near an engineering school? And I just thought that was interesting because you know I we talk about places where I know Andrew. You know, you guys are. You have Hopkins. You have some other resources around. You have companies. Um, you know, Ted. You've you've taken advantage of Northwestern and some of your companies. W what would be your thoughts? Does anybody have anything? And or a Paloma, who who would be? Yeah, um, I think it's important to take a look around your community. Um, I actually met Kit Bradford at an NSF uh, panel with AAAS, and one of the things that stood out, and, and you can speak to this because you said it, but that he thought back and his grandmother was a maker. And if you look in the community and in rural communities, there are makers all around. I mean, think about that uncle who has a tool shed and is always tinkering with things, you know, stuff that you may have walked by and you thought was junk. There's somebody in there making, right? So, um, you know, you need to be creative about who you pull in. And if you want to do this in a school, for example, why not have a tool drive? I mean, you'd be surprised how many parents have you know, odds and ends and tools that they've kind of inherited over the years. Too many screwdrivers, too many hammers. Um, there might be um, some family members who sew, who can donate a sewing machine. And so, you know, you can really get started in a grassroots way. Making has spread throughout the country in a grassroots way. It's bottom up. It, it's, not, it's not because an institution came in and said, you have to do this, and, and top down you were given these magical, expensive tools. That's not how making has spread to millions of people across the country and across the world. Anybody else want to jump in there? 
I just might add that, again, going back to earlier comment, organizations like 4-H that are in, I don't know, some 3,000 counties across the nation, we have a huge interest from them and maker programs as they try to achieve their STEM mission, and so that can be a, a partner. And the one thing also you have going for you in rural settings is real estate's a little bit cheaper than in the urban settings, which is often, you know, the price of real estate in urban settings is often a, a, a killer. Um, so at least space is a little bit cheaper, but find those local partnerships uh, that, that could be out there for you. Yeah, one one of the first jobs I had was working at a school called Raven Gap Nakuchi School, which is located in Northeast Georgia. And uh, the Foxfire books—I don't know if you guys have heard of those—but that was uh, basically a, a describing a maker culture that had developed in the uh, Appalachian Mountains during the uh, I guess early 20th and 19th centuries. So it is a uh, it is part of who we are. Um, does anybody else want to contribute to that question, Chris, Andrew, Ted? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one, one or two things real quick, which is, you know, have fun and start wherever you are doing something. Uh, and especially through, you know, like the connected internet, you know, where, where all this stuff is everywhere. You could have kids making websites for real clients even if they're not physically in the same city or location as them. You can, you know, connect to, to others doing amazing things wherever you are. Uh, and the group that came down were for, to work on building a 3D printer with our student, they were from a rural kind of area of Maryland. Uh, and you know, so so traveling to places, whether it's up to a, a mini maker fair, you know, get on the road and and take that opportunity to go connect with others uh, and bring it back with you and recognize, as Paloma points out, you know, that you, you in the rural countryside you live in a maker zone. I mean, that's uh, it really is. It's people tinkering all the time and. Uh, you know, just recognize it for what it is and, and have fun along the way. Great. Well, I think that uh, brings us to pretty much the end of uh, where we are, and uh, thanks to, uh, so much to folks in, uh, in California. And uh, uh, Mark, thanks for, uh, Chris, thanks for joining us. Uh, Mark, Ted, Andrew, um, and uh, we look for, we can't do the Brady Bunch thing, I don't think quite yet on Google Hangouts, but um, anyway, we, uh, this has been awesome, and this will be archived on our, our site, and it's available on YouTube uh, on the ted.wells at STEM Connector channel, and uh, thanks again, and I uh, look forward to keeping this conversation going. We plan to have a, at least one of these every single uh, month next year, if not two per month, but next month we will be doing one on computer science education. Uh, and the advocacy piece, which ties in nicely with this topic. And we'll also be looking at, um, it's too bad Carlos left, but some of the competition winners uh, from uh, some of the major national uh, science and math competitions. So have a great day, and thanks so much. Thank you.